the protege of Xi Jinping, the leader of China and the Chinese Communist Party. Mr. Bobulinski, Rob Walker told this committee that Joe Biden met Chairman Yi. Are you aware of that? Yes or no? I am now. I wasn't at the time. And Joe Biden also met with you. Is that right? Yes, he did. Twice. Who, who is Director Zhang? Director Zhang was uh, the number two at CFC. The executive director of CEFC, the number two? Yeah, he was the number two executive, but really the point person that uh, I worked with and the Biden family worked with, and he's the individual that Hunter Biden was shaking down at the end of July 2017, demanding that they fund the uh, $10 million. They ultimately sent five, but $10 million directly to Hunter Biden's account, Owasco. Thank you, Mr. Bobulinski. I want to show you a text message that Hunter Biden sent to you and his other business associates. I'm holding it right here. I'll read it to you. Hey, Tony, I have an idea. In light of the fact we are at an impasse of sorts and both James' lawyers and my chairman gave an emphatic no, I think we should all meet in Romania. He's speaking about my chairman. When Hunter Biden came in for his deposition, he said that he was referring to Chairman Yi and that the rest of your group referred to Zhang as a different chairman. Does this make any sense to you? That's a lie. I never heard Director Zhang reference as chairman, <clears throat> and I had direct com communications with Director Zhang over WeChat, <clears throat> met him in Romania, met him in Moscow, met him around the world in New York, trying to develop this business, and he was never referred to as the chairman, first of all. Second of all, that makes absolutely no sense in the context of this message because we are discussing Oneida Holdings, LLC. Thank you. Chinese so he was not the chairman, just to clarify. Yes Correct. Or no? Okay. So I want to show you another text. When he said his chairman, he was talking about his dad. This is from Rob Walker. It didn't seem to make much sense to Rob Walker either. So he said that when Hunter, he said this to you, when Hunter was talking about his chairman, he was talking about his dad. When Rob Walker came in to give his transcribed interview to the committee, he basically said, well, Hunter was high or confused or mad. And Rob Walker said that he was just trying to calm things down between you and Hunter. But that doesn't really answer the question about who Hunter Biden is talking about. Hunter Biden lied to this committee. So... Here, clearly, he says, Rob Walker's saying he's talking about his dad. So I want to be very clear. We've established that Zhang is not the chairman, obviously. Is that correct? Yes or no? Correct. Let me show you another message. This message doesn't call Zhang Chairman Zhang, does it? It just says the Chinese want to do business with the Bidens. As a matter of fact, it says, both coming to be my partner to be partners with the Bidens, with an S. He, Zhang, is implied, has implied that the number one has made it clear and available to him. Who is the number one? The number one is Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, the president of China? Uh, yes or correct. no? The leader of the Communist Party, the CCP? Yes. Is the number one? Yes, that's the number one that Hunter was referencing in that message. Now, let's be very clear. This was in 2017, but I would like to make it known for this committee uh, that Joe Biden told the press in 2016, as a matter of fact, he, I quote, yeah, I am. I am going to run in 2020. He told the press in 2016 that he was running for president of the United States in 2020. So here is the Bidens doing business in China in 2017 when everybody knew he was planning to be president of the United States. Do you see that to be a serious problem, Mr. Bobulinski? I do, and I wish this committee would thoroughly investigate it and focus on all the evidence that the SDNY has on CFC. They had FISA warrants, so they were recording conversations, and I wish they disclose all that data and fact to this committee. Thank you, Mr. Bobulinski. I yield, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady yields back. Chair, and I'll recognize Mr. Cristomorte for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Parnas, Rudy Giuliani tasked you with, quote, a mission to travel the globe to find dirt to damage the Biden's reputation in the 2018-2019 timeframe, right? Correct, yes. And this was in an effort to secure Trump's uh, 
re-election re in 2020. To, as president in 2020, right? Correct, yes. And by dirt, you mean evidence of wrongdoing or criminality, right? Yes, sir. And in your travels, you found, quote, precisely zero proof of the Biden's criminality, right? Correct. And there was no evidence of the Biden's corruption in Ukraine because, as you said, there truly was none, right? Correct, yes, sir. Now, interestingly, you have looked for dirt around the world about the Bidens, and specifically Joe Biden in particular, and you say the FBI, CIA, NSA have all failed to produce any evidence of criminal wrongdoing, right? Correct. Not only that, but former Ukrainian President Poro, Petro Poroshenko stated, quote, there's not a single word of truth to these allegations about Joe Biden, right? Absolutely, yes, sir. Now, there's a guy named Yuri Lutsenko, who's the former prosecutor general of Ukraine, and he also, quote, confirmed that nothing ties the Bidens to criminal activity in Ukraine, right? Correct. And then there's another prosecutor general named Viktor Shokin, who also said, he conceded, quote, they had, that he had no evidence that either Joe or Hunter Biden had ever interfered with Ukrainian law, right? Yes, sir. And the reason you know this is because you talked to each of these people, right? Yes, sir. And your, your job was to try to dig up dirt or manufacture dirt, right? Yes, sir. And yet we have conducted months of hearings, and because there's been no evidence of wrongdoing, you've called this whole impeachment inquiry a, quote, wild goose chase, right? Yes, sir. Now, interestingly, we've heard from the other side that, quote, the real quid pro quo wasn't, wasn't Donald Trump. It was Joe Biden when he tried to hold up foreign aid when he was vice president in exchange for firing the federal prosecutor in Ukraine that was investigating the corruption from his son. Now, you, again, looked for evidence to support this claim. There is no evidence, correct? Correct. That was false. In fact, firing the prosecutor would make it more likely that they would go after the company in question, Burisma, not less, right? Well, the ironic part is the reason why majority of the world and Ukraine and the Obama administration wanted to fire, get rid of Viktor Shokin because he was corrupt, not because he was investigating Burisma, because he was stalling investigations for UK that was looking into a $23 million they wanted to get out for, uh, 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 from Zlachevsky, and Shokin uh, stalled that investigation. So it was just, the logic is just the opposite of what the majority claims is to be the case. Yes. Namely, that they say that somehow Joe Biden was out to fire the prosecutor to reduce the chances of a prosecution of Burisma. But actually, in firing that prosecutor, he increased the chances of in prosecuting Burisma, right? Absolutely correct, yes. So let me just talk to you about what some of the other witnesses in this impeachment inquiry have said. Jonathan Turley, the constitutional expert the Republicans brought forward, said there's no evidence of which he was aware to support impeaching the president. You agree with that, correct? 100%. Garrett Graves, a colleague of ours, said just last week, quote, have I seen anything that is impeachable? No, I haven't. You agree with that statement as well? Yes, sir. Last year, our Republican colleague, Ken Buck, who's about to retire, said he... <laughs> That evidence of wrongdoing by President Biden, quote, doesn't exist right now. It doesn't exist now. It didn't exist then, right? That's exactly true, sir. Sir, how many times have you met Donald Trump? Uh, well over 10 times, I'd say. I don't <laughs> have to count, but lots of times. Is there anything that you'd like to relate to us about your conversations with Donald Trump that would bear on the uh, conduct of these proceedings? I mean, Donald Trump was aware of everything that was going on on that day in the Red Room when we were in uh, the uh, White House after Rudy bringing Donald Trump up to speed on uh, that I could go out to Ukraine and get Viktor Shokin. Donald Trump approached me, shook my head, said thank you for all that you're doing, keep up the good work, patted me on the back, took pictures, and I was off to Ukraine. To meet with Viktor Shokin? To, to find Viktor Shokin, to bring him back here to meet with Lindsey Graham. Got it. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Cloud from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Now, we have heard time after time uh, Biden 
Joe Biden say that he had no knowledge whatsoever about the business dealings and that changed. He had never allegedly had a, any conversation with Hunter. Then they moved the ball to say that, well, he didn't have any business dealings, he wasn't involved, didn't have any fin financial contribution. Since then, we've uncovered about 20 shell companies and we have bank records that bring light to that. And while we can't cover uh, all 20 shell companies in uh, five minutes, I wanted to focus on one, and that is Rosemont Seneca Bohai. Uh, Rosemont Seneca Bohai is, is interesting. Um, and uh, Devin Archer had testified, and he said this in his uh, testimony. He said, um, he said that, uh, he said that this entity, quote, was used as a common entity, owned 50-50 on a handshake deal between Devin and Hunter splitting these shares. Actually, that was your words, Mr. Galanis. Do you stand by those words? Yes, I do. And Devin Archer agreed with that. He said Hunter was a corporate secretary of RSB and had a handshake 50-50 ownership deal. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And, and primarily this company was set up uh, to uh, initially uh, as a place to hold equity from, from the equity stake of Bohai Harvest. Uh, is that correct? Um, <clears throat> what I was told by, uh, by, by the partners at the time was set up to do that and invest in other businesses. I think Devin Archer subsequently testified to that effect. And it, it included monies that were paid from the uh, uh, bond fraud, uh, $15 million that was wired to, to that RSB account as well. Yeah. So it conducted multiple transactions uh, as, as, as you depicted in that uh, uh, diagram. And even if this were legal and there was no impropriety here, it's, it's very concerning because this company set up to basically compete against America's energy in interests uh, at the behest of CCP. Uh, then we have uh, other flows into Rosemont Seneca Bohai from Burisma. We all know about Hunter's $1 million salary that he received for sitting on the board and providing no uh, actual function there. Uh, and so we have one million salary going through Rosemont Seneca to Hunter Biden. And then this is interesting. We have uh, a meeting with uh, Kazakhstani Kins Rekashev. Uh, and, and, and what gets me here is the $300 at the end of the $142,300 that goes into this. And then the next day went to a Porsche dealership uh, for a car for Hunter Biden. Now, what's interesting about all this uh, of course, is that each of these not only flowed money through the shell companies to Hunter Biden, but each of them also involved important meetings uh, with, of course, uh, President Biden. And so on December 4th, we have coffee with Jonathan Lee, who was one of the members who started uh, Bohai Harvest. And uh, he was connected with the CCP. Uh, they were having trouble getting licensed to work because, of course, the CCP has to get permission for that until Hunter flew over with, on Air Force Two with uh, Vice President Joe Biden at the time. They met with Jonathan Lee. Hunter introduced him. Uh, Joe ended up writing a, a letter of recommendation to uh, Jonathan Lee's daughter to get into college. Uh, and then we see that this relationship continues to be formed. Of course, in the Ukraine, we, we know that uh, April 16, 2015, Joe Biden had dinner with a Burisma official at Cafe Milano. Seemed to be a popular spot because Joe Biden also had dinner with Keynes Rekashev there. Uh, all in flow to going here. And of course, as Tony Pawlinski has pointed out several times, this all comes down to eventually uh, the one big guy who gets 10% for the big guy. And so we know that all this money flowed through this to get to Hunter and then we know, of course, that 10% uh, went to the big guy. So, uh, Mr. Bobolinsky, does this general pattern of Hunter offering foreign access to Joe Biden, Hunter gets paid and then Joe gets a share of that, is that basically what the general practice across many of these shell companies were? Congressman, as I outlined, uh, the big guys clearly Joe Biden the details of some of those transactions I was not involved in, but that's clearly how they operated. But that's the pattern thought. that we've seen over. And Mr. Galanis, you said uh, at the beginning that Hunter didn't really provide any sort of intellectual propriety, asset value, or anything of, of the sort, that his entire value 
uh, was the brand. Is that correct? How did you state that? Yeah, we, we didn't rely on him for any work product other than uh, delivering the Biden lift. The, the Biden lift. And, and one more question for you, Mr. Galanis. Did you offer to provide information on, on Hunter Biden and Devin Archer back in 2016 to prosecutors and the SEC? And what happened there? Yes, yeah, through counsel, I had uh, offered to provide information on specifically on that to the SDNY. Um, and I subsequently also did the same thing to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, which was interested in, subsequently was told to quash that interest. Um, I understood that to be in, a, in order from the Southern District of New York to uh, quash the SEC uh, information. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, now recognize Mr. Goldman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we only, I only have five minutes, Mr. Bobulinski, so I'm going to try to move quickly, and I'd appreciate if you just answer the questions. You testified that uh, Joe Biden was involved in your business venture related to uh, Oneida Holdings and Hunter Biden. So I want to drill down on the crux of what your testimony is. Oneida Holdings is the business venture that you are referring to, correct? When I'm referring to what? Can you ask Any business you did with the Bidens. Uh, my reference is the Sinohawk Holdings uh, LLC and Oneida Holdings LLC owned 50% of that. Right. And Oneida Holdings was the 50% uh, that was on the American side of that Sinohawk deal, right? It was the 50% that was the Biden side of it. Some of the, you know, James Giller year is not an American, so. Sorry. Fair enough. Um, and it was a, a joint partnership memorialized in an incorporating document, correct? And it had equal shares divided among five partners. Is that right? Well, I can't. Well, Are you asking me about what you're holding up? I mean, because you're-, I, you're I, Sir, you're, was it an equal, were there equal 20% shares among five partners? In, in what? Oneida one, Holdings. In the final signed documents? Yes. Is that what you're asking me? Yes. It is? Not complicated. Well, it is because- um, All right, you're just filibustering now. The answer iteration. is, you're filibustering, I get it, that there were five partners, Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, Rob Walker, James Gilliar, and you. Each owned 20%. Do you well, well, they didn't each own their LLCs owned it, which is a material Do you difference. see uh, Joe Biden or an LLC related to Joe Biden on I this? Don't, I don't know if Joe Biden owned any of Jim Biden's LLC or Hunter Biden's LLC. I'll leave that up to the committee. Okay, and do you know when this agreement was entered into? Um, the poster board that you're holding up or the actual legal document that was signed? The agreement, sir. Look, we, the agreement. Uh, the agreement was signed May 22nd, 2017. Who was the vice president then? Uh, May 22nd, you said? I think it was Mike Pence. And who was the president? Uh, Donald Trump. Okay, and when did you first meet Hunter Biden? I first met Hunter Biden in early 2017. When? When in 2017? The day or the month? An hour the month is good. Month? Uh, I believe I briefly met him in New York, but I spent the, the first meeting I had extensive time with him was in uh, early May 2017. Okay. And that was around the same time that you had those two meetings with Joe Biden, right? It was, but prior to that, I had numerous so, discussions look, you have with said, Hunter. You have said I had lawyers that, sir, working sir, through the documents. I, 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 that you're can asking. I please reclaim my time, sir? As okay. I said, we have to move quickly here. Um, uh, unfortunately, you, in your testimony earlier today, one of my colleagues asked you about that meeting at the bar, 45 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, and you were also asked about that in your transcribed interview, and in neither of your answers did you mention any discussion that you had at that meeting with Joe Biden about the Chinese business venture. Yet, in grandiose terms here today, you have declared that Joe Biden was involved and that you have mountains of irrefutable evidence to support it. So let's look at the mountains of irrefutable evidence. You provided the committee with a screenshot of a text message that uh, is between James Gilliard and you, dated May 11th, 2017. You see this? I don't know if you can see it. If you can't see, it's uh, just you and James Gilliard, though, right? You remember this text message, I'm sure. Uh, generally, yes. All right. And in it, Gilliard writes, man, you are right. Let's get the company set up, then tell H and family the high stakes and get Joe involved. And two days later, Mr. Gilliar sent an email to you, CCing, 
Rob Walker and Hunter Biden, in which he suggested a division of the company and included a proposal of, quote, 10% held by H for the big guy, question mark. You remember that, right? Uh, the infamous e uh, email with the big guy? Yes, yeah. I do. Um, did anyone ever respond to that email? Yes, they did, numerous times. Sorry. Hunter Biden ever, himself excuse me, did. Excuse me, I, you're right. Well, no, did I think that's important because Sir, Hunter Biden has claimed that he didn't can you respond to it, and he responded okay. to it. The, I believe, you're just going to filibuster. I reclaim my time that's running out, but I will say no one responded to the big guy reference for 10. Thank you so for making my what? point. They didn't have to respond right. because then, they all knew the big sir, guy was Joe I Biden. I reclaim my time. Mr. Chairman, please control the witness. I would like to say, I would like to uh, get a little extra time, Mr. Chairman, because I want to read what Mr. Gilliar said to the Wall Street Journal. Quote, I would like to clear up any speculation that former vice president was involved with the 2017 discussions about our potential business structure. I am unaware of any involvement at any time of the former vice president. The activity in question never delivered and project revenue. Nine days later, the agreement without Joe Biden was signed. You and James Gilliar wanted Joe Biden involved, and that is why Hunter Biden dumped you and did the business That's on his own. That's a blatant lie, Mr. Goldman. Back. You know better. The chairman's time's expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Higgins from Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bobulinski, thank you for being here today, and we appreciate the candor of your responses, sir, which is reflective of, of the way you handled yourself in private testimony and deposition. So I thank you for communicating truthfully to the American people today. I'm going to ask you about the China Energy Fund Committee, the CEFC. You familiar with that, sir? I am. Is this a multi-billion dollar company, like a Fortune 500 company at one time? It's even bigger bankrupt? than that. If you go back and look at its financials, in 2016 and 17, it was probably one of the five largest com okay. private companies in China. So exactly. So this, this was a this was a, a a major a major operation that had a lot of money, and apparently I'm going to hold up a, a memo here from this is a chart from from the second bank memo, and it shows disbursement of a total of. Uh, almost $24 million for diamonds. It, so you have, a, you have a major Chinese company spending a lot of money on diamonds, and apparently diamonds were used as a, a means of payment for the Biden family. We know that, that, that the Bidens have testified that admitted to having two diamonds, we suspect that there are many, many more, $23 million worth of diamonds. Um, are you familiar with the exchange of, of valuable assets to pay the, the Bidens other than electronic transfers of monies? Are you aware of, of uh, payments in diamonds, payment in cash, payment in uh, in board memberships, et cetera? Am I generally aware of it yes, or was sir. I involved? Yeah, I, I, I read Jim Biden's and Hunter Biden's transcript multiple times. Jim Biden in that transcript references two Biden or two diamonds that were given to Hunter Biden. One he implies was in 2015 by an individual who he, he couldn't recall his name, but the individual's name is Scott O who was a surrogate for CFC, and then apparently a second diamond was given at a meeting in Miami, and I really want to set the record clear. I was not at that physical meeting. I was in Miami, but I was not at that physical meeting. That's what I told the FBI in my transcript interview. Are you aware, Mr. Bobulinski, of, uh, of a pattern of, of bribery, of bribe payments coming from the China Energy Fund Committee? I appreciate that question. I wish everyone on this committee would read the 1,200 pages of testimony in an eight-day trial in the SDNY where Mr. Goldman used to work while the actual trial was going on that accused numerous executives, ultimately Patrick Ho, of corruption, bribing, leaving shoeboxes exactly. of cash to a so, variety of political figures in Africa. Exactly. So, Mr. Bobulinski, from, from, your, from your perch, within the Biden family operations and their interactions with uh, major 
businesses in China in the exchange of millions of dollars that are known. We track them through bank rec records, through suspicious activity reports, through emails, through communications that this committee has documented. It's, it's, it's no, it's, there's no debate that millions and millions of dollars flowed into the Biden family's bank accounts. But the existence of, of other forms of payment is fascinating because diamonds are untraceable. We really don't know how many diamonds the Bidens received, do we? We don't, and for somebody who's been to mainland China probably 10 plus times, Hong Kong probably 15 plus times, yeah, I had hundreds shift. of people, uh, Congressman, I had hundreds of people working for me in mainland China. At one point, I never got a diamond from I mean, any I, businessman I or woman. So, Mr. Bobolinsky, I shift quickly to a text message. Um, are you familiar with this? It's from a gentleman named James. Generally, yes. Yeah, it says, don't mention Joe being involved. It's only when you're face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. And there's a response saying, okay, they should be paranoid about things. And then there's a response saying, for real. So what is meant by don't mention Joe being involved? It's only when you're face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. Well, I think it outlines how the Bidens operated, not specifically just with CFC. You have Galanis here testifying and numerous other witnesses that have given you tremendous amount of evidence that outline they, they work to obfuscate it, create layers of obstruction. That's the reason why Rob Walker was getting sent millions of dollars instead of Hunter Biden directly. That's the reason why Devin Archer was receiving millions of dollars instead of going to Hunter directly. You guys have a mountain of evidence that stacks high and answers that question on how they obfuscated, they lived in a world of plausible deniability. Thank you, Mr. Bobolinsky. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield. Chair now recognize Ms. Norton from D.C. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Galanis, thank you for appearing voluntarily for this hearing from Alabama. I understand you are currently serving a 189-month sentence in federal prison, almost 16 years after being convicted of not one, but two, uh, but not one, not two, but three different schemes. The victims of your schemes as the judge who presided over your criminal prosecution noted, included, and here I quote, one of the poorest Native American tribes in the country, as well as pension funds held for the benefit of transit workers, longshoremen, housing authority workers, and city employees, hardworking people, everyday people, among others. The court also noted that you personally benefited from these schemes, and again, I quote, using over $8 million, uh, almost $9 million, for lavish personal expenditures, including home expenses, automobiles, travel, clothing, jewelry, expenses, and meanwhile, investors were left with nothing. But this is not your only encounter with prosecutors. In another case, the Security and Exchange Commission charged you in 2005 with accounting fraud in connection with your investment, your involvement, rather, with Penthouse Magazine. And in 2010, you were convicted of attempted tax evasion and were sentenced to five years probation in order to pay nearly $2 million in restitution. In imposing your uh, prison sentence, the judge noted that you are, and here I quote, an extremely, extremely talented man, extremely gifted in his interpersonal skills, uncommonly so. He is very persuasive uh, as an individual, and those were the tools in his tool bag uh, of the fraud he committed and the people he ensnared, his intelligence, his interpersonal skills, his charm, if you will, and this is something that is not unseen in people who are commonly referred to as con 
artists. Another judge who presided over your case referred to you as, quote, a skillful con artist. A skillful con artist, that is who my Republican colleagues are relying on to carry their water in this sham impeachment inquiry after their last star witness, the author of the infamous FBI Form 1023, was indicted for lying and outed as a likely Republican agent. It is time we put an end to this pathetic and desperate inquiry. I yield my remaining time to uh, Ranking Member Raskin. Ms. Norton, thank you very much. Uh, so for more than a year now, we've heard <clears throat> innuendo, rumors, propaganda, big lies, but no facts, no evidence that could reasonably support the finding of impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors against President Biden. In our first real impeachment hearing, uh, the majority invited several expert witnesses who came together and their witnesses agreed with that, that there was nothing that remotely approached the level of proof needed to support a finding of high crimes and misdemeanors that one would impeach a president for. And now we come back again today and the majority has two witnesses, one, the designated con man as determined by two different federal courts, not without talent, but someone who deploys his talent towards the purposes of exploiting Native American Indian tribes, pensioners, and other innocent investors. And then Mr. Bobolinsky, who offers uh, a lot of rhetoric and a lot of hot air, but absolutely no facts that could indict the President of the United States for high crimes and misdemeanors, impeachable offenses against the Republic. The kinds of offenses which James Madison said are great attacks on the Republic itself, great affronts to our Republican form of government. And nobody on their side can even tell us what is the impeachable high crime and misdemeanor, which suggests that they are moving in the direction of criminal referrals and they should start by looking at their own witnesses. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to remind the, the ranking member and Ms. Norton, the witness, uh, Mr. Galanis, was partners with Hunter Biden. That's why he's here. We have their partners. You could have invited partners, but you invited uh, this guy. Yeah, Donald Trump's partner, Mr. Uh, Parnas, who oh, was working with Donald, Donald Trump, Trump and Rudy Giuliani. Rudy, Rudy Giuliani's All right. partner. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Grofman. Yeah, we got a variety of things I'd like to go through. But first, uh, Mr. Lynch complained about Mr. Galanis testifying from prison. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the Department of Justice's own press release announcing the, the sentencing of the Democrats witness Lev Parnas to 20 months in prison for, among other things, making false statements. Without objection on Donald Trump's partner. You're, you're Thank you. Now, now Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, we, we had originally hoped uh, that we'd see a few more witnesses to here today. They're not here, but I would like to run a brief tape because I showed up today hoping I'd be ask, asking these witnesses a little bit more about this tape. Um, I, I know that the, you know, there's some mystery or some people feel it's still ambiguous as to how this prosecutor was fired in Ukraine, and I wonder if this tape could do a little bit more to shed light on why that prosecutor was fired and why we want Hunter Biden and Mr. Archer here today. Uh, and uh, so I got Ukraine. and. Uh, um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah, I said I'm not going to. We're, we're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Well, oh, son of a bitch, <laughs> got fired, and they put in place someone. 
I, I just wanted to put that up there because I do eventually want further further efforts made to get Hunter Biden or, or Mr. Archer here because we have Joe Biden himself bragging that they got rid of a, uh, uh, a prosecutor who would have provided his uh, son's business dealings mm -hmm. with uh, a little bit um, more, more tough uh, going or more observation. I'll put it that way. Now, Mr. Bobolinsky, in, in previous interviews, uh, you tra in previous interviews with this committee, you said that Joe Biden not only knew about the family's business dealings, but enabled them and participated in them. You went so far as to say, it's clear to me that Joe Biden was the brand sold by the Biden, by the Biden family. Could you elaborate a little bit why you felt that way again? Correct. Um, that's one of the challenging things I've had to deal with over the last four years with a focus of just simply telling the truth. The obfuscation around these facts are just beyond, <clears throat> beyond insane. So I'll use a meeting at the Four Seasons Hotel in Washington, D.C. that I was not at, but apparently eight to ten Chinese executives of CFC were at with Chairman Yi and Director Zhang. Director Zhang I uh, interacted with extensively. And James Gillier was in that room, Rob Walker, Hunter Biden was in that room. And my understanding, based on Rob Walker's testimony, is that Joe Biden walked into that room, sat down, shook hands with people, and spent five or ten minutes talking about his family, I guess. I was not in the room. People have tried to obfuscate that meeting, like Joe Biden was walking in there to ask about the weather, and Rob Walker said that the Chinese didn't even know that Joe Biden was the former Vice President of the United States, which is beyond absurd. The power that those 10 Chinese individuals had to go back to mainland China and say that they were in a room with Joe Biden is the value of what they were giving. Okay. Uh, you stated that the, the, Biden, the Biden family concocted a scheme to give Joe plausible deniability. Could you, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well. I would just point to all the different text messages and communications. They call him the big guy. Um, I wasn't involved with Mr. Galanis or, or Mr. Archer, but they're giving you numerous data points. Um, there was obfuscation. They didn't use his name. They used the big guy. You weren't supposed to talk about it. It was just, uh, okay. you know. And, and, and you personally met with, with the vice president. I did twice. Okay. And it was obvious. Did he say anything that indicates that you wanted him to help his son, that sort of thing? Well, well, he thanked me for helping his son and his brother and asked me to keep an eye on them as I walked him out to his car after he gave his speech uh, on the second meeting of the uh, Milken Conference. Okay, just one other follow-up, and this is kind of maybe a vague question, but I'd like to know it. One of the things that disturbs me about that is the interaction with the Chinese, or that's what we're dealing with today, but obviously other countries as well, that apparently in their own mind, the way you deal with the United States is the way you deal with a say, a corrupt city council or something like that. In other words, you know, you give them money and you get what you want. Do you want to comment on that, or did you hear any stories about that, or was it, did you hear stories that they were surprised how easy it was to buy the U.S. government? Well, I think and, it, and it was... Uh, tired, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, answer I, the question, but okay. please feel free to answer the question. Yeah, I think, the C, I think CFC, and it, there's tremendous evidence, believed that they were bribing the Biden family, and they were doing it via Hunter Biden. It's, it's kind of shameful. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Chair, now recognize Mr. Khanna for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Parnas, can you tell me about your meetings with uh, Dmitry Firtash and why uh, you believe the Trump campaign used his services? Yes. Uh, well, I was sent to meet with Dmitry Firtash because Dmitry Firtash uh, had uh, resources. He, he's an oligarch that was in Vienna waiting to be extradited to the United States. But he was very close with uh, Vladimir Putin, Ukraine, and uh, lots of uh, characters in that part of the world. And our, my objective at the time was to have him help us lean on Mykola Zlachevsky and get uh, dirt on the Bidens. And what type of dirt were you trying to get? Uh, we were searching for Hunter's uh, hard drive that we were told was out there. We were searching for bank records uh, to validate certain bank records that was given to me, Hunter's personal bank records uh, that was given to me by John Solomon that he said he got from the FBI. 
uh, to validate certain payments that were going uh, for car purchases. But the objective was to try to find a link from uh, any of the payments that would, would go into uh, Joe Biden's account. And who told you to get this dirt? Uh, well, who told me? Rudy Giuliani. Uh, anyone else that you remember? Uh, John Solomon. Uh, I mean, everybody that was part of the team. I mean, Deb Did Bill Barr was... know that you were involved in getting this dirt? Absolutely. Bill, was, Bill Barr was notified of our investigation from the day he took office. Did you ever have a conversation with Bill Barr of being lenient towards Dimitri uh, in his role, in Bill Barr's role as Attorney General? I personally did not, but I was witness to uh, Victoria Tunzing and Joe DiGenova having a conversation with Bill Barr about Dimitri Firtish. What did they say to Bill Barr? Uh, basically, they were telling him that the um, charges were false and that he needs to drop the charges and basically end the case. And why did they tell him to drop the charges on this Russian oligarch? Because Dimitri Firtish was going to help us um, getting dirt on the Bidens or whatever else the Trump campaign needed. So my understanding is you have the Trump campaign telling you to talk to a Russian oligarch to get dirt on the President of the United States for political reasons, and then someone from the Trump campaign is talking to the Attorney General to drop the charges because this foreign national is helping get dirt on a political candidate? Absolutely. Did Bill Barr indicate any willingness to drop the charges? After a meeting that uh, Victoria Tunzing and uh, Joe DiGenova had with DOJ, uh, they came back and informed me that we're going to Vienna because to tell Dimitri Firtish everything's going to be okay. Do you know if Bill Barr uh, in any way told you to say that? I was not privy to in that meeting, no. Do you have any uh, evidence that Bill Barr would have uh, indicated uh, to signal to, to Dimitri to, that the charges would be dropped? Only from conversations from Rudy Giuliani or Victoria Tunzing. And what did they say about what Bill Barr said? They basically told me that this would be taken care of as long as Firtish played ball. And that's the message they relayed to me to tell Firtish. And they said that Bill Barr was uh, conveying that to them directly? Uh, yes, after meetings. There were several meetings. One, there was a private meeting at, uh, where Rudy Giuliani went and bumped into actually Bill Barr at the Trump International Hotel, and he used that as a moment to take him aside, speak to him. And then there were certain official meetings through official channels where Victoria Tunzing met with him. So, yes. Do you know anything, if, if anything was done with the charges? Uh, till this day, Dimitri Firtish is not here. Do you believe that Bill Barr should be investigated for uh, his conduct in potentially dropping these charges? I absolutely believe that, but not only that, I believe Bill Barr should be investigated into the cover-up and trying to silence me to get the truth out of what really happened in Ukraine. And explain the cover-up and what you believe he should be investigated with your last minute. Uh, it was, my arrest was set up strictly to shut me up, to seal my documents, take away all my information, and turn me into a crazy man that had no way to prove what was going on. Uh, but the real story was Bill Barr was trying to save Donald Trump from impeachment and use me as a scapegoat. What he didn't realize was Donald Trump was not going to stop and was continue doing what he wanted to do. And that's why it blew up in Bill Barr's face. He also hired a special uh, counsel at the time, Brady, to look into Ukraine. When we tried to reach out with my attorney to uh, special counsel Brady, he never returned our phone call. Nobody wanted to hear anything I had to say that had to do with Ukraine, Donald Trump, or Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Chairman. Wait, with the gentleman yield. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parnas, I just want to say you have stuck to the facts today. We don't hear bombast and rhetoric from you, but you're telling a true story and you've conducted yourself with great purpose and great dignity. And I know your son is here with you today and I hope he and the rest of your family are proud of what you're doing for America. You're back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Donalds from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's been an interesting hearing so far. Let's actually get to the actual paper trail of money flow um, from the CEFC into the bank account for President Joe Biden. And I want to start with a text message, July 31, WhatsApp text message between uh, Hunter Biden and one chairman, uh, one Mr. Zhao. Um, real quick, uh, Mr. Bobulinski, who is Mr. Zhao? Um, Congressman Donalds, I'd just actually uh, like to spend 20 seconds. If you noticed, uh, Congressman Khanna scurried out of here very quickly. And I'm actually disgusted as I sit here that he didn't address me based on the fact that I'm sitting here in front of the world trying to testify to the truth. In October 2020, I have messages I'm willing to produce to both the Democrats and the Republicans that Ro Khanna sent to me saying, you have never, 
you have always demonstrated to me that you're nothing but an honest with the highest integrity individual, and I was begging for him to go on CNN and tell the world in October 2020. I have extensive emails with Congressman Ro Khanna in 2021 and 2022 where I begged him and his staff to sit down with me and look at my BlackBerry phones that the Democrats are so focused on, to hire forensics experts and go through all of the factual information I had. So the fact that he did not even address me and then scurried out of here is disgusting to me. All right. Sorry, Mr. Donalds, I'll answer your question now. All right, so we're gonna have to come off of that because now we're at three minutes, 30 seconds. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, for the record, I wanna submit into the record two different WhatsApp text messages. One, July 31, between Hunter Biden and Chairman Z and Mr. Zhao of CEFC, which stipulates that Hunter Biden wants to be able to move on from and get the, get the uh, contract resolved, get the deal resolved, and that Mr. Zhao re responds and says, yes, the CE CEFC is willing to cooperate with the family. On August 31, there is another, inf there's another exchange, this time, August 3rd, excuse me, August 3rd, 2017, between Hunter Biden and uh, Mr. Ganwei Dong. And in this, in this uh, message, they're talking about the stipulations of the arrangement between the Biden family and CEFC. I want to submit both WhatsApp text messages for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection to order. Okay, now, to the money flow, because this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. On August 3rd, they actually stipulate through WhatsApp text messages the exact stipulations of the deal. On August 4th, $100,000 is wired into Owasco PC from CEFC infrastructure. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record a, a, a portion of the bank statement for the time period August 3rd of 2017 to August 31, 2017, stipulating $100,000 going from CEFC into the bank account of Hunter Biden through Owasco PC. With that objection, to ordered. On August 8th, four days later, $5 million is then transferred from the Northern International Capital account of $5 million to Hudson West III. Hudson West III is a bank account controlled by Hunter Biden and Mr. Gon Wang, AKA Kevin Dong, who was a CEFC associate. That money comes from a Northern International Capital a bank account, a bank account that is tied to the CCP. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record the bank statement demonstrating that transfer. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, moving on. On August 8th, the same time period, there is a wire transfer of $400,000 to Owasco PC from the, How the, the Hudson West the third bank account. That $400,000, Mr. Chairman, I have the transfer records in the bank accounts from the August time period. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, to ordered. Now, here's where the fun stuff comes in, everybody, and I got a minute to do it, so we're going to get this done. On August 14th, there is $150,000 that is transferred from Owasco a PC, which is controlled by Hunter Biden, to Lion Hall Group, which is controlled by James Biden. I have the records here, Mr. Chairman, of the $150,000 that has gone to Lion Hall Group from Owasco PC. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, to ordered. On August 28th, and I believe we have a screenshot for everybody in the room. On August 28th, Mr. Chairman, we have the withdrawal ticket from Lion Hall Group that is signed by Sarah Biden, who is the wife of Jim Biden, for $50,000 to withdraw from Lion Hall Group. I want to submit that withdrawal receipt for the record. Without objection, to ordered. On September 3rd, on August 28th, actually, Mr. Chairman, we have the deposit reference into Sarah Jones Biden's account on the same day she withdrew it from Lion Hall. I want to submit Without that Without objection, to ordered. Last document. On September 3rd, 2007, from Sarah Biden's own personal account, there is a check that is written to, to Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the President of the United States today, for $40,000 signed loan repayment. A loan repayment, by the way, that Joe Biden's own personal accountant, Mr. Eric Schwerin, has no record for. I want to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, to ordered. To the members of the committee, it is clear that the source of this money came from CEFC, and that CEFC is a company that is directly linked to the CCP and, and uh, actually the chairman of the CCP, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, Chairman Xi Jinping. With that, I yield. Very good. Mr. Chairman, I've got a UC request, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, first, uh, White House for sale, the staff report of the minority side, uh, which details the CEFC's uh, business interactions with 
Donald Trump. They own a $5.5 million uh, unit in w Trump World Tower and others. And then the, uh, the Department of Justice press release announcing the sentencing of Jason Galanis in federal court to a term of 189 months in prison, ordering him to pay restitution of more than $80 million for three criminal fraud conspiracies against a Native American tribe, pension funds, and other investors. Without objection to order. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Bafume for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm sitting here and um, imagining what I would be thinking if I were not here, but rather somewhere around the country watching the Congress of the United States, and in this case, this committee, for 15 months hold these hearings on Hunter Biden and come up with not one impeachable offense in all that time. 15 months, over 10,000 documents and more, as you can see today, as a result of that. This is a do-nothing Congress. And we should be doing the jobs that we were sent here to do, which is not to have investigation hearing after investigation hearing over and over and over again, and then run to our favorite TV outlet to give interviews afterwards. We were sent here to get a job done. Taxpayers are looking at all of us. Meanwhile, Americans, black, white, Asian, Latino, Native American, and their families are wondering what the hell is going on. Do, is this another investigation hearing in this 15 months that has yielded nothing at all? It's the do-nothing Congress. You thought Harry Truman said it in 1948. Anybody can say it today. Look at what we've done in 15 months, virtually nothing, nothing at all. Senior citizens sit in their homes and watch C-SPAN or some other outlet carry this. Some of them are sitting in nursing homes, all of them worried about losing their social security. They're on fixed incomes and they expect the Congress to use its time and its energy to deal with things that affect them directly. Students are defaulting on loans to colleges all over the country, and no one wants to talk about that. Health care is inadequate in most places in this country, and diseases are ravaging our communities, and people assume that at some point the Congress will deal with that. And so whether it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, diabetes, HIV, stroke, the disparities in the health system say, please, Please give us a little bit of your time also when you're not dealing with Hunter Biden and when you can't prove that he's done anything wrong. Crime is out of control, white collar as well as black collar. And assault weapons are still being used every day to shoot and kill innocent children and Americans. And we're sitting up here talking about something that we've talked about for 15 months with no substantial evidence. Can't get humanitarian aid to Palestine, can't get military aid to the Ukraine. Children are looking and wondering what the hell is going on. Is that what politics are about? So we, we are doing a disservice. I, wanna, I know I'm supposed to be asking questions, and Mr. Parnas, I may have one or two for you, but I am so outraged at a do-nothing Congress just pointing the finger, pointing the finger over and over again, and people are hurting looking for real help, can't deal with immigration because Donald Trump calls up and kills the immigration bill, and yet people say that's the major issue, is it? I haven't seen the sort of attention that we thought we were putting to that or anything else. And so this particular hearing will probably be followed by another hearing and another hearing and another hearing until this Congress expires in January of next year and we haven't done a damn thing to move the ball forward, except make accusations. Life is too short. Now, maybe some of you have a guarantee you're gonna be around forever, but I don't. I came to this body first in 1987. I worked under Ronald Reagan and the first Bush and Bill Clinton and Donald Trump and now Joe Biden. This Congress is not doing anything. It's not like the previous Congresses, trust me. That's why people have such a low esteem of those of us who say, well, I'm Congressman so-and-so. People on the street don't buy that. They don't see the action. So I'm done. I know I've exhausted my time. Mr. Parnas, a couple quick questions, and I'll, I'll let you go. 
Is it your understanding that Rudy Giuliani worked for an individual identified by the Trump administration as a Russian agent? Yes. Do you know what these Russian line actors were trying to do quickly? Push a conspiracy theory about the Bidens. Did you know that, did you warn Rudy Giuliani? Yes, I did. And what was his response succinctly? He told me that he, I mean, he agreed with me, but then proceeded to work with these people behind my back. And these people have been identified as Russian agents. Yes, sir. And we've got a meeting here of Mr. Giuliani with one of those. I'm just, uh, I'm disgusted as most people are about this process. And the only way we get to a point where we get things done is that we learn to talk to one another across the aisle without having another conspiracy theory after another one after another one. You don't buy trust that way. You buy contempt. I yield back. Chair recognizes Lisa McLean for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start off by saying I think most Americans are taught at a very young age that you are who you surround yourself with. I think keep that in a premise as I sat here the, and listened to everyone talk about how Hunter Biden is just this golden boy. I mean, are we really supposed to believe that Hunter Biden is the golden boy? His associates, such as Jason Galanis and Devin Archer, are felons convicted of fraud, yet he is the golden child. I want to talk about examples of Biden's influence peddling scheme. This time, it was Romania. It follows the same general pattern as we have seen with other countries like China, Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Here's the pattern. It's really simple. A corrupt foreign oligarch needs access to the U.S. government. Hunter Biden sells influence to the U.S. government. The oligarchs pay up. So let's just take a deeper dive into this Romanian scheme. Mr. Bobulinski, who is Gabriel Popovich? Gabriel Popovich is a businessman from Romania, probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars, I'd envision. Okay. Is it true that Gabriel Popovich faced corruption charges in, in Romania in 2015? It is. Thank you. And when you were in Europe with the Bidens to close on that CEFC deal with the Chinese, you separately negotiated with Popovich to get a 17th payment. Is that also correct? I did. Okay. But Popovich did not want to pay him. Is that correct? Correct. You're talking about a 17th payment that would go to Rob Walker and then Rob Walker would distribute to Hunter Biden. That is correct. And is it because Hunter Biden had failed in the work he was engaged by Popovich to do, which was to get the corruption charges dismissed by the Romanian authorities? Isn't that correct? Well, it's two things, that they had failed to do that, but also that Joe Biden had left the White House at that point. Okay, so there's a dot. So I get 16 payments while Joe Biden's in the White House. Correct. But after Joe Biden leaves the White House, coincidentally, the payments stop. Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure that we can connect the dots very simply. But obviously, it wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> right. I'm not much more for, much for coincidences, which neither are the American people. But, Mr. Bobulinski, what do you think Popovich wanted Hunter Biden to do? I don't have to think because Gabriel told me personally he expected and didn't want the details. He expected Hunter Biden, Rob Walker, and James Gillier um, to do whatever was necessary to impact his case in Romania. But how, how do you know that? Uh, because Gabriel Povich told me that? From his mouth? Yes. Okay, so there's another dot that we can connect. Would that be a conspiracy theory? That's not a conspiracy theory. Okay, thank you. I would encourage you to interview Gabriel Povich. Thank you. Lastly, after claiming he wanted a public hearing, Hunter Biden decided to skip today. Why do you think he skipped the hearing today? Is that a rhetorical or a serious? Well, 
I don't think he wanted to sit next to me because obviously um, I've emphatically stated he perjured himself in his transcribed interview with, uh, with the committee, as did his uncle Jim Biden. And for every fact he claims or wants to say I was high on drugs or obfuscate, I can show a document, a text message, a recording that is cross, you know, confirmed that uh, he's lying. Well, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story, right? Here are the facts. Highly disappointing that he's not here, though. <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. Um, here are the facts. Hunter Biden was engaged by a foreign principal, Gabriel Popovich. It is well known that Hunter Biden met with the ambassador to Romania, Hans Klem, in November of 2015. Hunter Biden was not registered under FARA. He stopped getting paid as soon as his father leaves office until you got Popovich to send Hunter Biden one more payment. Seriously, what services was Hunter Biden providing to the Romanian oligarchs for millions of dollars? We've yet to hear it. As far as the committee knows, Hunter Biden was never registered under the Foreign Agents uh, Registration Act. If the Department of Justice applied the same standards it did in the Paul Manafort case, Hunter would be in more trouble than he is already in. Mr. Chairman, there are real FARA issues here that we need to continue to look at. And with that, I thank you for being here, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Thank you. Good job. Chair now recognizes Ms. Ocasio-Cortez from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Bobulinski, I, I heard your opening statement. It's submitted to the record, part of our proceedings. I have a quick question, simple. Is it your testimony today that you personally witnessed President Joe Biden commit a crime? I believe the fact that he was sitting with me while I was putting together a Did business Did you deal, witness the president commit it, a crime? Is it your testimony today? Yes. And what crime do you, uh, have you witnessed? How much time do I have to go through it? It is simple. You name the crime. Uh, Did you watch him steal something? Cor corruption statutes, you, RICO and conspiracy. What is it? What is, Sarah, what is the crime, sir? You, you specifically you, just, uh, wait, you keep uh, you asked me to answer the question i answered the question no Rico, you're obviously not familiar with corruption excuse statute. me sir excuse Ara. me sir excuse me sir rico is not a crime it is a category what I is the, it's the category crime? of crimes that you're then charged you under have charges long hundred you have charges yeah. sir please you want me to name, name the exact statute sir, under rico yes I'll, well, it's funny. In this committee room, everyone's not here. There's over eight All right, sir, I reclaim my lawyers time. that went I reclaim to law my school. Time. I I'll reclaim leave it my up time. to you guys okay, to thank define you, the sir, I reclaim my time. Rico. Clearly, what we are seeing here today is a continuation of the 15-month saga of the Republican majority lost in the desert. Impeachment 101. The majority party or whomever is raising impeachment must accuse the president of a high crime, a specific high crime or misdemeanor. I would like to submit to the record HRES 918, the House resolution to open this impeachment inquiry. Without objection to order. This resolution does not outline a high crime or misdemeanor. It's not here. Now, when we compare the chairman's opening from his previous opening, he's talking about Ukraine and Burisma and all of this. It is, this entire inquiry is based on a blockbuster piece of information that was in a classified stiff room. And inside that room was a document alleging President Biden directly of a $10 million bribery scheme, a $10 million bribery scheme, extremely serious. What happened? What happened a month ago, Mr. Chairman? That document, the FBI arrested the person who offered those allegations for falsifying the, his testimony at, to the FBI. This entire impeachment inquiry is based on an, on an actual, provable individual who has lied. Now, responsible leadership would withdraw an inquiry based on that. Withdraw it. Instead, what we are seeing 
is that this committee was warned about the falsehoods of these allegations long before that, warned by Trump Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and yet they proceeded anyway, the chairman proceeded anyway. This committee was warned by Rudy Giuliani associate right here, Lev Parnas, after that document about the falsehoods of this. Then held hearings where your own expert witnesses said that there was no grounds for impeachment and you proceeded anyway. And finally, as if none of this was enough, the FBI arrested the individual who was the source of the entire, to quote the chairman, heart of the matter to launch this impeachment inquiry and proceeded anyway. At this point, the story is not the fact that the basis of this impeachment inquiry is wrong, the story is why it's proceeding anyway. Why is this committee proceeding based on false charges? And if there, and by the way, no charges. I have yet to hear in the chairman's opening the allegation that they are specifically charging the president of the United States with. I'm hearing about Biden family. I'm hearing about this and that. I am not hearing the specific allegation by this committee. What is it? It's not here. And that is the problem. The story is when this committee knew that they were working with falsified evidence. That's the story. And with that, I yield back. Ch Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Mace from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On March 1st, 2024, Joe Biden stated he did not interact with Hunter or Jim Biden Business Associates. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to un ask unanimous consent to enter into a record New York Post article. Biden insists he did not interact with his family. Without objection to order. We're going to go fast here. I have strictly yes or no questions. On that note, the New York Post article, Joe Biden also said, read the record of every single witness. So I did. I first read Devin Archer's deposition and he interacted with Joe Biden. Then I read the transcripts of Wab Walker, Eric Schwerin, George Burgess, Kevin Morris, Tony Bobulinski, and Jason Galanis. And every single one of them interacted with Joe Biden. And that's just the people we interviewed. Mr. Galanis, my first questions are for you. Did Hunter Biden call Joe Biden with Elaine <laughs> Baderina on the line on May 4th, 2014, yes or no? Yes. In that call, did Hunter Biden state on this call with Joe Biden that everything is good and we are moving forward? Yes, he did. Okay. On the same call, did Joe Biden in the call was saying, okay, then you be good to my boy? Yes, he said that as well. Okay. Did Baderino, Baderina agree to put $20 million into one of Hunter Biden's business projects days later after this phone call? Yes. Okay. Did Hunter Biden ever take a call from Joe Biden while at the Peninsula Bar in New York? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did Hunter Biden ever take a call from Joe Biden while at the Peninsula Bar in New York? Yes, he did. Did this during this call did Hunter Biden update Joe Biden on progress in a landing a business partnership with Harvest Fund Management? Yes. Okay. Was Harvest a three hundred billion dollar Chinese financial services company closely tied to the Chinese Communist Party? Yes, it was. Okay, is Hunter and Biden involved was is Hunter Biden involved with Harvest? Uh, Hunter Biden is involved in Harvest in two ways, through BHR, which is the fund Yes or no, that, uh, was, Hunter Biden, was Hunter Biden involved with Harvest, yes or no? Yes. Okay, as part of the Extensive deal... Extensive emails to that effect. As also. part of the deal, did Hunter Biden want the company to reserve a board seat for Joe Biden? Yes. Okay, did, did Henry Zhao, a Chinese businessman, want assurances Joe Biden would join the board, yes or no? Yes, he did. Okay, did He's Hunter Biden... He's expressed that in, 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 in emails as well. Okay, thank you. And, Hunter in Biden, conversations. Did Hunter Biden draft an email stating, please also remind Henry Zhao of our conversation about a board seat for a certain relation of mine. Devin and I golfed with that relation earlier this week, and we discussed this very idea again. And as always, he remains very, very keen on the opportunity. Um, here is a photo of uh, Joe Biden and Devin Archer and Hunter Biden golfing days before the alleged email draft. Do you believe a certain relation of mine refers to Joe Biden? I don't think there's any question. It was based on first-hand conversations with Devin Archer, who, who was okay. at, in that picture and at that golf meeting. Did yes. you ever did you ever meet with Devin Archer where Hunter took calls from his father? Yes. Okay. During one of these phone calls, and Hunter Biden tell Joe Biden that he and Henry Zhao needed help getting quote getting across the finish line. 
Yes, that's correct. Okay, Mr. Bobolinsky, do you recall receiving an email that floated the possibility of giving 10% ownership of Sinohawk to Joe Biden through Hunter Biden? Yes. Okay, my questions, my last questions are for both of you very quickly. Um, Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis, you both stated you were told not to use Joe Biden's name in communications, correct, Mr. Bobolinsky? Correct. Mr. Galanis? Yes. Okay. Did Joe Biden participate in phone conversations and meetings with Hunter Biden, his business associates, and foreign interests, yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? He clearly did. He okay, Mr. Question. Galanis, yes or no? Yes. Okay. In Hunter Biden's deposition, he said he did not involve his father in his business. Did Hunter Biden lie under oath, yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Uh, if that's what he said, yes, I will okay. be true. Is Joe Biden lying when he says he did not interact with Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, their business partners, or forward interests? Yes or no? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Yes. All right. In a debate on October 22nd, 2020, Joe Biden denied Hunter Biden made money from China. Then Hunter Biden, his business associates and foreign interests include money from Chinese businesses, business partners, and or interests. Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? I'm sorry. Did, did, uh, the, did, did the Biden, Biden family make money? money from Chinese Correct. business interests? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Did Hunter Biden money receive from money from Chinese business interests? Yes or no? Uh, yes, he was, okay, yes, you. he had economic interests and yes. All right, Joe Biden yes, has Congress. repeatedly claimed that he was not involved in, in Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, or any other Biden family business deals. Today, our witnesses have proved otherwise. Today, we've established Joe Biden lied about interacting with Hunter Biden's business associates. It is my belief Joe Biden is the closer for Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, and their business associates and foreign interests. Good luck to the left proving otherwise. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Porter from California. The title of this hearing is Influence Peddling, Examining Joe Biden's abuse of public office. Look, the impeachment inquiry is dead. If it was on life support, my colleague Ocasio-Cortez just killed it. There is no allegation of a specific crime. President Biden didn't do anything wrong. There's zero evidence of that. And still, both Democrats and Republicans and the media treat these hearings like the Super Bowl. But no one ever wins, and Americans always lose. So I've got a fresh direction for this hearing. All we have to do is cross off the part after the colon. colon. There, just influence peddling. We should have a policy discussion about how to stop government officials from using their positions to get money or favors. Now that is a real hearing, one that nearly every American, regardless of party, wants us to hold. We could start by talking about how senior executive branch officials can leave public service, wait just one year, and then legally become lobbyists for big corporations, scoring their new employers profitable government contracts and favorable regulations. They can even be paid by the big corporations during that short one year while they are waiting to become lobbyists as a down payment for their future ability to peddle influence. That's wrong. For the panel of witnesses, by show of hands, as, as um, Americans, would our witnesses support extending this one year waiting period to at least two years? No, I would. Okay, so there we go. Republicans, Democrats, even convicted criminals, everybody supports that we should do more to stop influence peddling. This is the kind of good government reform that Americans of all political stripes support. And I should know, in 2022, I passed that exact reform as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act with a bipartisan majority vote. What happened to that amendment? Why didn't it become law? The answer is simple, nearly 500 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. And too many people around here want to follow in their footsteps, and so don't want to make it harder for government officials to become lobbyists. Ultimately, Democratic leadership under then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi let the amendment get stripped out of the final bill. When I offered up the amendment again during this Congress, Republican leadership under then-Speaker Kevin McCarthy never even put the amendment up for a vote. Both parties have let us down 
on fighting influence peddling and tackling corruption. But I'm hopeful we can begin a new approach in this very committee. American, the American people should know that regardless of, American people, regardless of party, should know that an investigation was conducted into whether Joe Biden did anything wrong. We followed the evidence to where it led a dead end. So this impeachment inquiry should end today. And where should we go from here? We should stop partisan attacks on each other and address the real problem. That the American people believe that the rules that prevent corruption are way too weak. To stop politicians on both sides of the aisle from influence peddling. This committee should be working together in a bipartisan way to change the culture of Congress, to crack down on influence peddling and corruption, and just as importantly, to stop the perception of it. Let me give you some facts. I don't even need a whiteboard for this one. 495 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. 467 members of Congress take corporate PAC money. 78 <coughs> members of Congress violated the Stock Act last Congress. Clearly, we have our work cut out for us, so let's start the conversation today on what a bipartisan ethics reform package could look like. Here are the organizations that could have come today as witnesses so we could have had a productive conversation. Oversight staff, do you have your notebooks ready? Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, Common Cause, Project on Government Oversight, Public Citizen, with the right witnesses and the commitment to doing what the American people want, this committee can have a real conversation about the problem of influence peddling, and we can pass legislation to create badly needed ethics guardrails. That would be real work, not a real circus. I yield back. Uh, before I recognize Mr. Timmons, Ms. Porter, I think you are sincere, and I look forward to working with you on that legislation. Chairman, can we take a five minute break? I need to go to the bathroom. Uh, let, let us get one, one more and then we'll do that. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Timmons for, for five minutes, then we'll take a break because we have votes coming up anyway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At our hearing last July, I laid out the scheme that the Bidens concocted to sell the Biden brand, netting almost $30 million for various members of the Biden family. This scheme was repeated with various clients in Kazakhstan, China, Romania, Russia, and Ukraine. I'm going to spend my time on just one instance, Ukraine, specifically involving Burisma, which netted Hunter over $3 million during a three-year period. And to clarify the criminal offenses being alleged, for Hunter Biden, it is conspiracy to commit bribery, 18 U.S.C., Section 201B, uh, 2A, and C. And for Joe Biden, it is conspiracy to commit extortion under color of official right, 18 U.S.C., Section 1951B, 2. And if you want a refresher on those, just look up Senator Menendez and his wife's indictment. Um, so let's start with this. Foreign client has a problem. I've got an email here um, from Vadim Pazarsky, the Secretary of Burisma, and he is advocating that Hunter Biden intervene with um, U.S., high-level U.S. officials to facilitate meetings and communications expressing their positive opinion of Zlachevsky, the president of Burisma, to the Ukrainian president, chief of staff, prosecutor general, with the ultimate purpose to close down any cases against Zlachevsky in Ukraine. Uh, this is dated um, November 2nd, November 2nd. Now, keep in mind... And again, foreign client has a problem. Zlachevsky is being investigated by Viktor Shokin, the uh, inspector general of Ukraine, and he needs help, the Biden brand. So here we got bank records galore of Hunter Biden receiving, prior to this email, over a million dollars. After this email, $2 million. You'll find out in a second he really earned his fee. So again, client pays a Biden, $3 million. Next. What, is it? what happens? What happens? This is great. 11 days later, 11 days later, we have uh, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine announcing that Vice President Biden is traveling to Ukraine on December 7th. Oh, interesting. Vice President Biden travels to the country. Here we got a great photo of him touching down. They're very proud of themselves. So Vice President Biden leverages U.S. policy to achieve a favorable outcome for the client. We've all seen the video. He brags about leveraging U.S. foreign uh, loan uh, guarantees to get 
the Ukrainian government to fire Viktor Shokin to end the investigation. Again, we've got the email from Podarsky saying that we need to leverage you, who have not provided value yet for your million dollars in service, uh, Hunter. He brings in the big guy. Biden leverages U.S. influence, withholds a billion dollars in loan guarantee to fire Shokin. So if that's not enough, we got the victory lap here. We got a, an email just a few months later saying, uh, whoa, we won in less than a year. You brought us in, so take a victory lap. So look, I mean, this is straightforward. This is straightforward. Pay to play. It is bribery. Hunter Biden was paid $3 million at the lowest point in his life. He testified in the deposition that he was drug addicted, that he's never been to Ukraine. Yet he's paid $3 million to get his father to go to solve his client's problem. That is the scheme. Mr. Bobulinski, does this sound like the scheme that you've seen the Biden family do? I wasn't involved in Ukraine, but the uh, facts surrounding this are very similar to CFC and uh, Romania. Thank you for that. So this is the thing. If Hunter Biden were here, we would be able to ask him some questions, maybe clear this up. But he's not. He's not here. And what's interesting is that just yesterday, Peter Navarro reported to federal prison in Miami for four months for not showing up in front of the January 6th committee. And I want to point out to everybody that the January 6th committee was procedurally defective under House rules. It was procedurally defective because uh, the minority leader did not get to appoint members to that committee. The United States House of Representatives Oversight and Accountability Committee is a procedurally uh, perfect committee. And we have authority to subpoena Hunter Biden, and he has to show up. He has to answer these questions, and he has to tell the world that his father didn't leverage U.S. foreign policy so he would get $3 million. This is no different than what Senator Menendez did. And look, the American people are not buying this nonsense y'all are selling. We have to restore, we must restore their faith in our institutions. And we have to stop this ridiculous two-tiered system of justice where uh, the Department of Justice persecutes President Trump and uh, hides Hunter Biden behind every uh, corner. I mean, this is not the United States of America that the American people deserve. And we have to get our country back on track. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry, did the committee subpoena Hunter Biden today? The chair recognizes, uh, uh, pursuant to the previous order and at the request of the minority witness, the chair declares the committee in recess uh, for 10 minutes. Then we're going to come back in here, and then we may have to recess again for votes.
aisle for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is another unfortunate attempt by my Republican colleagues to muddy the water in an election year with no proof, no evidence, no wrongdoing at all by President Biden. The American people are tired of this charade. As I said before, my Republican colleagues simply grasp at straws that do not exist. While House Democrats and the Biden-Harris administration work to cut costs of prescription drugs, expand student loan forgiveness, and mitigate the threat of gun violence, Republican members of Congress continue to chase after Russian disinformation campaigns from the 2020 election, which have been thoroughly debunked again and again. And as usual, in this committee, we know who is in charge. It is the bondless, broke bluffer, twice impeached, four times indicted, insurrection initiator, election denying, self-declared dictator on day one, and puppet for Putin. The one who wants to terminate the Constitution and defund the FBI. The one who romanticized exchanging of love letters with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. The one who just last week embraced autocrat Orban of Hungary to discuss their diabolical plans to destroy our democracy. The one who proposed a policy to ban Muslims from this country. The one who just this week said any Jewish person who votes for a Democrat hates their religion and Israel. The one who called neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches tanting Jews will not replace us good people. The one who referred to African nations as, I quote, shithole countries. The one who called NFL players, the majority whom are black, sons of bitches for taking a knee in protest of the ever-present racial inequality and police brutality that continues to pervade our justice system. The one who called Mexicans rapists and promised to build a wall and have them pay for it, and in case you missed it, it didn't happen. The one who told women of color, from the United, born in the United States, elected to Congress and serving on this very committee to go back to their own countries. The one who bragged about grabbing women by their private parts. The one who confused his rape victim whom he claimed was not his type for his very own ex-wife. The one who is an admitted and committed adulterer who attempted to pay off a porn star for her silence. The one who has publicly mocked people with disabilities. The one who dodged the draft and referred to prisoners of war as losers, the very people who pay a high price so we can enjoy the freedoms that far too many of us take for granted. The one who boasted about being able to stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue to shoot some and shoot someone and not lose votes. The one who promoted political and physical violence multiple times, including most recently at my rally in the home state, my home state of Ohio, where he declared there would be a bloodbath if he didn't win. The one who intentionally denied COVID was deadly and eventually suggested testing injecting bleach into our bodies to kill the respiratory virus that took the lives of one million people in the United States. The one who ordered his son-in-law get top secret security clearance overruling concerns flagged by officials uh, intelligence officials, who according to this committee's chairman admitted the former president's son-in-law crossed the line of ethics by accepting a two billion dollar investment into that very same son-in-law's fledgling firm only six months after leaving the White House. If any of this sounds crazy, it's because it is. This might sound unbelievable, but it's all true. These are facts indisputable facts, a thing that is known and proven to be true. This may be a foreign concept to some of my colleagues, but for those of us who still have a relationship with the truth, please know this is not an exhaustive list of inappropriate, unethical, and questionable behavior by the maniacal manipulator of Mar-a-Lago because I could go on, but I only have five minutes. Yet here we are again, trying to make sense out of nonsense. I would humbly, respectfully ask my Republican and colleagues on this committee to stop falling over yourselves to win the approval of one because millions of people are depending on you to defend our delicate democracy. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time to Ch Chair the, the ranking member. Seven seconds.
Oh, I don't know that there's much time left, but thank you for that eloquent and compressed recitation of um, some of what we've lived with over the last few years. Chair recognizes Mr. Letourner from Kansas for five minutes. Mr. Bobulinski, I want to talk about May of 2017. To be clear, Hunter Biden was doing business with CEFC while his dad was VP. Are you aware of that now? Yes. Rob Walker told us that during his trans told us that during his transcribed interview before the committee. But I want to talk to you about your meeting with Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and Jim Biden in May of 2017. Other members are going to bring up the meeting you had with Joe Biden at the Beverly Hilton the night before the Milken Conference, but I want to talk about the next day when you went as Joe Biden's guest to the Milken Conference. So, you watched Joe Biden deliver a speech that day. Then you had a follow-up conversation with Joe Biden. Isn't that correct? Correct. What did Joe Biden tell you during that conversation? Well, as I've already publicly uh, shared, you know, I was brought backstage by his team um, because he had just given his keynote. and. You know, we just exchanged pleasantries, and then I walked him out to his car, and he specifically thanked me for the work I was doing with his son and his brother, and asked me to keep an eye on them. And my understanding is, Mr. Bobulinski, that after Joe Biden had left, you went across the street to the Peninsula Hotel and had a long conversation with his brother, Jim Biden. Isn't that correct? I did. It's my understanding that you asked him how the Biden family does the business that they do, while Joe Biden is such a prominent political figure. What was Jim Biden's response to you? Correct. I was actually concerned and asking from a position of concern, and Jim Biden's response to me was plausible deniability. Plausible deniability. And by that you mean Joe Biden would be kept in the loop, but you weren't supposed to talk about it, especially in writing. Mr. Galanis, during your transcribed interview with the committees, you said a very interesting phrase. Say it, forget it, write it, regret it. Does this sound familiar? Is this consistent with your understanding of how the Bidens do business, Mr. Galanis? Yeah, very, very much so. That was not right in principle, yes. But it looks like someone made a mistake. Mr. Bobulinski, you created two companies with the Bidens. I want to show you an infamous email discussing the ownership structure of one of those companies, CEFC. You can see on the screen, 20% for H, 20% for Rob Walker, 20% for James Gilliar, 20% for Tony Bobulinski, 10% for Jim Biden, and 10% held by H for the, quote, big guy. Mr. Bobulinski, who is the big guy? The big guy is 100% Joe Biden. Mr. Bobulinski, Hunter Biden didn't respond saying, knock it off. We can't include Joe Biden, did he? No, and that's actually a critical point because remember- Mr. Bobulinski, did, did you ever get a text message or a group text message or anything like that saying, guys, knock it off, Joe Biden isn't involved in this deal. No, the whistleblowers actually have a text exchange where they're talking about everything else but that, and the reason why they weren't talking about it is because everyone knew Joe Biden was the big guy. Hunter Biden begged for a public hearing, but it turns out he is too afraid of accountability to show up and tell the truth to the American people. But Americans don't need Hunter's testimony to know they are being gaslit by this president. It's blatantly obvious to anyone paying attention that Joe Biden is the big guy. The CEFC deal broke the say it, forget it, write it, regret it rule of the Biden family businesses, and now they are trying to cover it up. Joe Biden said repeatedly that his family never made a dime from China. But Mr. Bobulinski just confirmed that Hunter, Jim, and the big guy himself all got a cut from the CEFC China energy deal. Let me be clear. The only service the Biden family ever provided was their ability to leverage the office of the Vice President of the United States to cash in overseas. My Democrat colleagues are going to try and tell you that Joe Biden wasn't on the final ownership structure agreement, but isn't it true? If someone was holding Joe Biden's stake in the company, it wouldn't appear in the document. Isn't that the whole point of this email, to hold, hold Joe Biden's stake so his name wouldn't be in the document? Isn't this just plausible deniability in action, Mr. Bobulinski? It appears that way. But plausible deniability only gets you so far. Now, I want to fast forward from May to the end of July of 2017 when the Bidens cut you out of the deal. I want to show you a message that Hunter sent to his Chinese business partners. Please put it up on the screen. Hunter writes, quote, I am sitting here with my father and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. So, when Hunter Biden is desperate for money, Jim Biden's old trick of plausible deniability doesn't cut it. 
And when desperate times call for desperate measures, Hunter Biden let the cat out of the bag, said the quiet part out loud, and gave the game away by calling on his father to help him shake down his Chinese business partners for the money. And it worked. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, just point of inquiry. The, the, what was the last image we saw uh, that, that you put up? Where, where did that come from? I just want to authenticate that. Uh, this is the Ways and Means, Means Committee Exhibit 300. Must be the Irish whistleblower note. Right. Uh, not an inquiry, though. Anyway, uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Stansberry for the last question. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the GOP's day-long campaign for Donald Trump. Uh, I want to start with Mr. Galanis to help connect some dots that have not yet been connected in this hearing. Mr. Galanis, you are serving just under 16 years for, among other things, as has been said today, defrauding a tribal nation and specifically a tribal corporation held by the Ogallala Sioux, which is why you are testifying from a prison today. But I'd like to ask you, Mr. Galanis, have you had an attorney representing you before this committee that you retained last December? And that attorney's name is Mr. Mark Pauletta, correct? That's correct. And when you first testified before this committee in a taped interview, you were actually stopped by Mr. Pauletta from answering just a simple question about how you met him and who exactly was paying your legal fees. Now, I wanna make sure that the American people understand exactly who Mr. Pauletta is, because he is, in fact, a former lawyer to Donald Trump, who served in the administration in the Office of Management and Budget, and was at the center of the Ukrainian pressure campaign for which Donald Trump was impeached. And in fact, Mr. Pauletta was Trump's chief OMB lawyer when he withheld aid to Ukraine to try to extort the Ukrainian government into investigating Joe Biden to support Donald Trump's campaign. And Mr. Pauletta literally wrote the memo to help withhold those funds. Now, I want to dig in a little bit on this pressure campaign, and Mr. Lev Parnas is here to discuss as an eyewitness who was there. Mr. Parnas, we appreciate you being here, and I want to move through this quickly, so just ask for simple yes and no answers. You've testified here today that Donald Trump repeatedly asked you and through Rudy Giuliani to put pressure on the Ukrainian government to dig up dirt on Joe Biden to support Trump's co campaign, correct? 100% yes. And as we can see here in this picture, you were very much a business associate of Rudy Giuliani during this time. And as established in your testimony, you traveled to and met with Ukrainian officials and told them that the White House would support, would withhold its support and aid to Ukraine if it did not cooperate with this bribery, essentially. That's correct. And as we all know, Donald Trump's administration and specifically the Office of Management and Budget did withhold that foreign aid in 2019. And here's the guy who did it. And he's representing the witness who's literally on Zoom with us for this committee today. And it's the reason why Donald Trump was impeached the first time. And the man at the center of that scheme is involved in the House GOP's inquiry. But I also want to point out that Mr. Pauletta is also involved in and very much in bed with the Thomases. In fact, he represented Miss Jenny Thomas, Clarence Thomas's wife, in her involvement in the Stop the Steal before the January 6th. Uh, committee, and actually also goes on vacation with Mr. Harlan Crow and the Thomases. So this man has quite an interesting roster and uh, participation in this hearing. But the bigger picture here is that Mr. Pauletta's presence is yet another indication of the way in which this hearing and this impeachment inquiry is part of Donald Trump's larger misinformation campaign, just like it was in 2020, where in addition to pressuring and withholding aid to Ukraine, Rudy Giuliani and the Trump Organization, as Mr. Parnas has established, planted the story in the media. And now here we are four years later as they've dredged it back up and are planting it back in the media using Congress. 
using this committee and using a baseless impeachment supported by Donald Trump's own allies on this committee to push that information out. As members on this committee have trafficked in false evidence that was planted by a Russian operative to the FBI and is now in jail for that. All of this is in the service of propping up the criminal enterprise for which Donald Trump is at the top and has already been twice impeached. Rudy Giuliani and others have been exposed as they continue to traffic in Russian disinformation that not only props up Donald Trump, but it props up Vladimir Putin himself and his goals back in Russia and in Ukraine. So I just want to point out here that once again, as I said when we had a false impeachment hearing a few months ago, that once again we see the time's long expired. Arm Gentle ladies, time's of expired. Little hands of Donald Trump all over this hearing. And and just want to state, you made a mistake and said that uh, Mr. Parnas was a Republican witness. He is very much your witness, not a Republican witness. But I was a Republican for Donald Trump. Mr. Chairman, I do not I said that, so we can... Pursue it to the previous order. The chair declares the committee in recess due to votes. Uh, subject to the call of the chair, we will reconvene 10 minutes after the three votes. All right.